my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar a good evening to all here in bangladesh and a very good morning to all those who are watching this program live from argentina hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic i'm happy to share with you all that today it's our 99th international physics webinar so while we know that we are staying in a corona pandemic situation we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus so we have to start our online program to continue our academic program. Our department, Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology has started its online program, including online classes and online international physics webinar. We, we have successfully completed our 98th international physics webinar. Today is our 99th. And uh, we are trying to adjust with this new normal situation. Today is very uh, important day for our department. Today, I'd like to welcome you to a joint session between Pabna University of Science and Technology and the Department of Physics Research uh, Atomic, uh, Atomic Center, Balseiro Institute, uh, Argentina, in physics. And we have with us here uh, today Dr. Karen Halberg, uh, Professor, Department of Physics Research Director, uh, Bali, uh, Barilusu Atomic Center, Argentina. And she has already connected with us. I'd like to Welcome our speaker. So good morning and good evening here. So uh, wel welcome to our international physics event. And uh, we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pavna University of Science and Technology for accepting our invitation, madam. Good morning. Good morning, Pratham, and good morning. Uh, good uh, evening, Pratham. Good evening, everybody uh, there. It's 11 a.m. here, so I'm, I was, I'm so honored to have been invited to give a talk at your prestigious uh, university. So thank you so much for including me in this interesting uh, uh, seminar series. And congratulations for so many, so 99, so nearly 100. Yeah. So congratulations yeah, for yeah. this activity, and, and thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, and we are going to celebrate our 100th uh, uh, webinar on December 4th with a Nobel laureate. So thanks again for supporting us from, for uh, arranging this. So for those who are new, uh, I'd like to inform that uh, we have divided our uh, webinar in three parts. First of all, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker with all of you. Then she will uh, deliver his her speech. And at the end, we have a discussion time. In that time, anybody can join with us. So. I think you have already uh, come to know the title of this today's speaker. The title is the Precision uh, Electronic Spectral uh, Densities in Correlated System Using Quantum Information. Our, our speaker is Dr. Karen Halberg, Professor, Department of Physics and Research Director uh, from Argentina, uh, Balsero Institute from Argentina. And uh, you can see his her uh, academic and uh, career background. So she has completed her PhD in physics at, at, from the uh, Balsedo Institute. And uh, uh, she also worked as a principal researcher of the National Council for Scientific and Technology Research at, at the uh, Bailuso Atomic Center, Argentina. And also uh, as an adjunct professor of physics at the Institute of Balsedo, Argentina. And also as a head Department of Condensed Matter, National Atomic Energy Commission, and also a member of the Advisory Committee on Scientific Publication, Minister of Science and Education, Argentina, Council Member, and uh, Prague was a Conference for Science and World Affairs in 1995, Member National Committee on Ethics in Science and Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Argentina, Member International Advisory Committee, of the International Institute of Physics, uh, Natal, Brazil, Coordinator Committee of the International Relation of Institute of Balseiro, Member Con Consultative Committee, Council of Strategic Planning of the Province of Jujoy, Representative Argentina Branch uh, to the International Institute of Complex Adaptive Matter, and Board Member Alumni Association of the Balseiro Institute of, and Member Editorial Board of Science Review. And we can see her recognition award. And uh, she has authored more than 80 scientific articles in high impact international journal, edited a book, several book chapters, review ch papers, and outreach article. She had trained uh, four PhD students and five undergrads, uh, undergraduate students. She has visited and stayed uh, at several institutes such as Max Planck, uh, KFF, and PKS, uh, Germany and uh, Augsburg University, Germany, University of Foriburg, Switzerland, London Center for 
Nanotechnology and Oxford University and Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Boston University, and so on. So uh, thanks for all of your uh, patience. So now it's time to go to our speaker. So before going, uh, we want to dedicate our uh, this webinar to uh, Sir Dr. Chandra Bush and Diego Maradona. So this is uh, today is our uh, birthday of our legend, Sir Dr. Chandra Bush, and uh, we, we we want to uh, pay respect to our uh, legend player, Diego Maradona. Uh, so uh, he inspired us from our childhood. So we want to dedicate this program to him. So thanks for all of your patience. Now I want to again uh, welcome our speaker. So madam, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's your time, you can start your session. Thank you, thank you very much, Pratham, and uh, hello again to everybody. I'm very, very uh, touched by the fact that uh, you recognize uh, Diego Armando Maradona. He is, an, of course, he's an idol here in Argentina and uh, worldwide. Uh, I visited India several times. Regretfully, I've never visited Bangladesh. I really hope to do so. Yeah, at of, some course, point of course, in my I'll, I'll invite you in future after the COVID. <laughs> it will be, and, uh, it will be a we'll see will. that uh, how many fans of uh, Maradona have in our country. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. It will be also. Uh, it will be also a pleasure to receive you here at Pretam in, in Bariloche in the south of Argentina. Oh, okay. uh, but I, I just I just wanted to, to tell you that I was really impressed. Uh, with, I, I've, I've traveled a lot, as I said, um, but every time we went to different places, uh, I was uh, where are you from? I said, Argentina, ah, Argentina, Maradona. Everywhere in Malaysia, in Asia, in Japan, in India, uh, in even in Egypt, everywhere. So it, I was really uh, impressed. And well, now that he passed away, uh, really, uh, and we're all very touched by the international response uh, of of this idol. Now he's a legend now, and so thank you, <laughs> thank you so much for dedicating this to him. I also dedicate this talk to him, yeah. and uh, because I, I, in some way he unites the world. So as we do yeah. in science, we're doing that in sports. So yeah. thank you, thank you very much. So let's yeah, get thanks, started. Madam. Thank you very much again. Uh, I, I want to talk to you about what we're doing here on, on the, uh, as I um, introduced in, in, his, in the beginning, on precision spectral electronic spectral density in correlated systems. Using quantum information, this is a, a very hot topic. Uh, there are several groups uh, in different parts of the world. We're collaborating with people in the US, in Germany, also in France, and in Japan, and of course in, in other places as well. Um, uh, the, because we, we we are aware of the needs of of calculating theoretically with numerical uh, strong numerical techniques uh, the details of electronic spectral densities of correlated materials and this is a very difficult task as I show you in a while and we really need to do it to compare to experiments and to try to get the microscopic behavior of these materials which are very complex because as I say they are, they are strongly correlated and the electrons are interacting not only via the Coulomb interaction, but they also interact with the lattice. And uh, uh, you know that to date, uh, there's no um, explanation of high to see superconductivity, for example. And, uh, and this is due to the complexity of these systems. So let's delve into this. And I'd like to show you where the difficulties arise and where we're trying to uh, to advance this uh, this topic with um, numerical stimulation, so from the theoretical point of view, and we always compare with with experiments. Um, just to show you where we are, we are here in the south of Argentina. This is South America. Uh, so there, this is Argentina in, in light green, and in the south of Argentina. So so here with a red arrow is this is Bariloche. We are it's a ski resort, a very beautiful place. It's a national park, like. Uh, like I'm sure you have in Bangladesh too, very green. Uh, we also have a very high mountain. These are the Andes that separate us from Chile. And we are very close to the border with Chile. And it's a lake uh, district and it's very nice. So we enjoy nature a lot. So this is one of the pictures of, of one of the ancient volcanoes we have here in, in the region. Uh, this is an aerial photo of um, of the atomic center where we work. Uh, we, this is like a national lab. This is they call the the Bariloche. Bariloche is the name of the town. Bariloche Atomic Center. That huge lake at the back is uh, is a Nahuel Huapi Lake, and that's an island. So it's very very pretty, and all this green. These are the houses where we have the visitors, and we have the classrooms. We have the Balsedo Institute where where we, where we teach. 
and we do research. So here are all the labs. You see it's a very beautiful place to do research. Let's go into the physics now. Uh, what, what is the issue with strong correlations? Well, I've, I've adapted my talk to, to high, to high levels, to advanced students, um, not necessarily to experts. So, uh, excuse me if I might be a bit basic at some point or, or a bit advanced in other points. And then let's leave the questions and please, uh, ask questions at the end of my talk. I'll be very happy to, to elaborate on some points. Um, so, well, let's see, what is the issue with strong correlations? You know, Fermi liquids. This is a basic course in, in, uh, uh, solid state physics, what are Fermi liquids? We have, it, it's a basic theory uh, of solids when we have weak uh, interactions. So the electrons are interacting weakly. So we can, uh, we can perform a, a, um, one body theory of the, of the electrons. Uh, and we can also do a one to one correspondence between the bare electrons and dressed electrons, which we call quasi, quasi particles, which are electrons with, uh, best with interaction among them and with the lattice in an effective way. But it all boils down to having a, a one particle theory in which we, we begin with a Fermi surface of a non interacting uh, electron. But then when we dress the electrons, we can find an effective Fermi surface where we have instead of electrons quasi particles, but they resemble electrons very much. So this is a simple theory. Uh, it works very well for non-interacting or weak interacting systems like copper, for example, and uh, and we have very well behaved Fermi surfaces, and everything can be understood within the framework of one body particles. That means we can calculate the electronic uh, the electronic levels in that solid um, um, for one particle, and then we can fill up all these levels uh, to with with a chemical potential until the until uh, whatever from the energy we want to uh, and this is uh, this is uh, as i said well behaved we can have a metal insulator transition but the insulators are band insulators so they are not driven by correlations but the insulators are driven by the pauli principle in which we have filled bands and we have a gap given by the the atomic uh, structure of, of uh, the constituents of this solid so there's nothing uh, very, I mean, it's interesting because it works very well, but there uh, are no surprises. What happened um, in 1986? Uh, well, just a bit before people had been thinking about complex materials too, but in, 19, in 1986, you uh, must know, I mean, that uh, high-speed connectivity was discovered by a group in IBM in Zurich, in Switzerland, uh, Badnots and Müller, who later got the Nobel Excuse Prize. Me, madam, we cannot yes. see the ends of the slide. You can't see the slide. The sli slide is not changing. Yeah, slide is not changing. Could you start the uh, presentation mode? Yes, let me do it again. Uh, can you see this from a liquid? Oh, maybe no. No, let's see. It is in presentation mode, and I see I'm changing, but. Uh, let me, um, uh, it, it's, uh, yes, yes it, it, might, it, it might. We can see now, we can, we can see now the Fermi, but uh, it's a, it's not presentation mode. Could you start the presentation mode, full screen mode? Yes. Uh, please let, tell me if you can see the Fermi liquids, the two Fermi surfaces. Yeah, we can, we can see, we can see, but not okay. uh, full screen mode. Just uh, make it now full it, screen so that. Yeah. Let's see if you can see the, the high TC chart here. Yeah, we can see the Fermi liquid, but uh, not full screen version. Wait, uh, you let yes, um, let let me let me change my let let me change my my Wi-Fi because that could be a problem I have here. Uh, just one second, please, because it's uh, it is changing, but it's very slow. So yeah, now we can, it, it it have changed. So, but not the full skin. So, if you uh, make it full skin, then I think it it may helpful for all.
now yes hello yeah. pitam yeah now it's now it's better yeah yeah it's going to be better i changed yeah. my internet i'm sorry sorry for yeah. that sometimes yeah, yeah. things are te- technical issues it's okay it's, so okay. Now, it's okay madam could you please uh, let me share your file let me share again um i think now it should be it should be better now yeah let me uh, do you see the hitc yeah. chart yeah yeah you can see just uh, start the powerpoint mode presentation yes, mode it is okay can, can you see can you see the hitc supervisor yeah we can see the slide but uh, could you make it full screen version so it is full uh, screen already it is full screen uh, okay you can okay. carry on is it okay but we, we can't see the full screen uh we um i see i have a full screen here okay you can uh, uh, can you change so that i can check either it change or not yes can change the slide let's see Le- there from liquid no so could you could you share with the uh, entire screen mode yes uh, i'm going to share let me let me do it entire screen yeah, um yeah. let's see okay Yeah. I think it it should be better than maybe. Yeah, it should it, it will work. Yeah, now now it will be okay. Just choose that file in uh, yeah, background yeah. I think it will it will be okay now. Yeah, now it's What do you see? Okay. Yeah, it's it's Fair, fine. Huh? It's fine. It's fine. Family yeah. liquid and high high yeah. super connectivity. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh well now let, let me so we were talking about a one uh, one body problems and then i said in 1986 high tc superconductors were discovered uh by the group in zurich and in a, in a in a complex compound which is lanthanum barium copper oxygen compound they they were not looking for high tc superconductivity but they were looking for other properties metal insulator transition in these materials and they found that the resistivity the resistivity went suddenly to zero at a certain temperature with, which was around 30 kelvin and uh, and this uh, was a discovery of superconductivity at a higher temperature than uh, was previously found and here you can see a chart where i have the temperature in the y axis and and the year and this is the evolution of the of the tc so the critical temperature below which these materials become superconductors Here you see us a whole bunch of materials uh, starting from the beginning of last century with mercury with lead niobium etc all these were low temperature superconductors with low temperature means that there were superconductors below 10 kelvin and then uh, here in blue you see the onset of high tc superconductivity and uh, and then uh after 1986 and to date many other materials um, were discovered and and um synthesized based on complex materials with binary ternary quaternary materials based on on complex uh, transition metals uh, or even w- or also with the rare earth uh, elements and uh, and this discovery led to an important uh um development and activity in the research of of these systems which are complex which are strong which have strong interacting electrons and which is which are not easy to treat uh, theoretically because one cannot treat uh, as one cannot develop a simple theory of a one particle uh theory like for fermi liquids and then start building up um uh, from that so one has to really use numerical methods of very complex a uh, many body theory based on green's function and response functions to study these materials if you if you see if you look at the right uh, can you hear me prism yes is yes, madam okay. can okay okay uh, just checking uh, to the right you see the one of the complex uh, crystal structures of these materials for, as you see it's formed by oxidants with the red dots the copper with the orange barium with green yttrium with blue and you can find in some of these materials in most of them copper oxygen planes like the one here with copper o2 and these uh, these planes seem to be very important uh, is a low, lower dimensional lower than three dimensional substructure within these materials that apparently is very important for the high tc superconductivity but not all the high tcs have these two dimensional structures 
So it's still not understood what the basic uh, mechanism be be behind the HITC is. So we cannot uh, prescribe or design materials that have HITC superconductivity because we don't know what the basic mechanism for superconductivity is. And this is what we want to find. Uh, besides the normal state properties, so not, not um, superconducting, but the normal state properties of these materials at temperatures higher than the, the critical temperature, are also very interesting because they do not follow the normal Fermi liquid behavior. Like, for example, the resistivity is not linear, it is, uh, it's not, uh, sorry, the, res the resistivity is linear, it's not quadratic, uh, the susceptibility has also different behaviors, we have logarithmic behaviors. And all this is a non, it shows a non-Fermi liquid behavior of these materials. We also have pseudo gaps. We, these materials show uh, pneumatic order and and uh, etc. Et I mean, a, they have a whole set of behavior which is very interesting and which is not completely understood. So, so um, uh, let me now uh, go to the electronic spectra of these materials. What is electronic spectra? It, it's uh, what I show you here in these experimental results, uh, we can measure the electronic spectrum by photo emission experiments, which are called ARPES or PE. ARPES means angular resolved photo emission spectra. That means that the experiments can uh, resolve with different K momentum, and they, they can see not only what, what uh, energy the electrons in the, in the, mo in the system have, but they, they can also uh, know uh, what uh, K distribution, what momentum distribution they have. So they're called spectral densities. If you look at the, in the left, we have um, uh, the Y axis. We have several different uh, materials as a function of binding energy. So the, the X axis is the energy of the electrons which we pull out. So photo emission means we, uh, we bombard the system with photons and we and we extract electrons. By measuring the energy of the extracted electrons, we know what energy they had in the system. So if you, if you look at the x-axis, this is the energy uh, loss by the original, the electrons within the material. And this is uh, uh, the intensity of these electrons that are pulled out from the material with photons. Uh, if we look at this bottom one with yttrium titanium oxygen, for example, we have where you see zero, he has zero energy means a Fermi energy. And if we, we barely have a density of states, we have a finite density of states here because it's done at finite temperature. But uh, in principle, this is, um, this is an insulator because we have a zero density of states here at the Fermi energy. Remember that the, the density of states means the amount of electrons we have at, zero, at the Fermi energy. If we do not have electrons at the Fermi energy, the system has a gap and the system is insulating. We do not have electrons to move around the system to form a metal. The, uh, if, you, if we change the, the material, we go up to, we go to other materials. These are all shifted curves. Uh, for example, in this material here, or in this one with vanadium, we see that there is a finite density of state at the Fermi energy. This means that the VO2 here is it, it, a, 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 in a metallic uh, phase. Uh, what is interesting to see here is that, for example, we go down again to the yttrium, we have zero density of state at the Fermi energy, and then we have a, a hump at, uh, at a particular energy which corresponds to the transition between D1 to D0. So we have here uh, a transition metal which has had one electron in the D level of the transition metal, and when we extract that electron, it goes to D0, so we have no electron in that metal. And this is at the energy at, minus, at uh, let's say, 1.5 or something. You see, we have structure. If we change the materials to lanthanum, titanium, strontium, vanadium, etc., all these dots, which are experimental results, they acquire a structure. They acquire a density. Uh, a density, finite density at the Fermi energy, and they also have uh, humps and structures at different energies, which shows us what the structure is uh, of the electrons within that material. What is interesting here is the, this um, uh, continuous curve. This continuous curve is, the, is band theory. Band theory means uh, it's a one particle, one body theory, uh, like here, if you, if you look at this material, um, 
the band theory works quite well at a continuous line compared to the experimental result. But then uh, if, we, uh, if we go down in this curve, means increase in interactions, you see U, this is the U, the, the local Coulomb interaction as compared to the bandwidth. This is a very small interaction, so band theory works very well. When we increase interactions, when U is, is larger or much larger than the bandwidth and the hopping, than the kinetic energy, uh, then band theory starts to fail. Here it fails very badly in, in lantern and titanium oxygen because it's not band theory, ab initio theories, or what is called LDA, so local density approximation of another method called DFT, which is density functional theory. They work very badly for interacting systems. They cannot deal with interaction. So one has to resort to other, other models or, or, or sophisticated numerical methods to study these materials. Here, I, I give you another example of the valence fluctuations and also densities of state and quasi-particle multiplets uh, in, in a certain group of very strongly interacting materials like uh, plutonium uh, tellurium or plutonium antimony. These are called plutonium chalcogenides and pnictides. This is a work by Gabi Kotler, whom we're collaborating with, and, and Haule and other collaborators. And here you can see the experimental results in the density of states, again, versus the energy. Remember, zero is a Fermi energy. The, the, this blue curve is the experiment. And here we see structure, again, a very strong structure. Uh, we have these peaks here, and these are multiplets and, and uh, of the constituent uh, elements in this material. And here the LDA does not work very badly. It's an orange curve, but it fails to get all the structure. Uh, the, the same here. The, these are experimental results in blue, and the LDA is really very bad to get the results. So what do we have to do? We have to we have to try to uh, to get the, the information in a special way. Uh, and let me go in now to quantum information a little bit to introduce you to this. John Preskill, Preskill said in, in 2000 uh, that the most challenging and interesting problems in quantum dynamics involve the understand, understanding the behavior of strongly coupled many body systems. This is very challenging. Better ways of characterizing the features of many particle entanglements may lead to new and more effective methods for understanding the dynamical behavior of complex quantum systems. So uh, in short, uh, John Preskill was, uh, was stating that it's very important to develop new methods that take into account uh, quantum information to be able to extract the most important information in these systems, because we cannot deal with all the um, many degrees of freedom. We, we really have to develop a method uh, which is efficient in capturing the most important information or the most important parameters we need in these systems. Let me just, uh, let me just do a very quick introduction to the density matrix normalization group. Why? Because this method, this method what is called the DMRG I've been working with for many, many years, uh, has been one of the most important uh, numerical techniques to study these materials because by using the density matrix, which I, I, I talk, I'll define it in a while, by using the density matrix and diagonal, diagonalizing this density matrix, automatically we get the most important information, uh, the most important quantum states in the system. And this method has been very useful uh, for calculating strongly correlated systems. It was developed uh, in 1992 by Steve White. Uh, he's in Arvine in the US. And uh, there's a PRB and a PRL. You can search, and they're, they're very, very well written. In fact, I could develop my first uh, codes in, uh, soon after that, in 1994, by reading his paper. So the basic, um, the basic idea behind this is the following. Let's let's think about the uh, about the Heisenberg model. The Heisenberg model uh, in in a finite uh, system, let's say a linear chain of n sites. The Heisenberg model is this: the Hamiltonian is j times s dot s. So these are nearest neighbors, and uh, this is the rotationally invariant Hamiltonian. So each spin is a spin one half. So you you can imagine the system of having n sites. And in each site, we have a spin up and spin down. We have a spin one half, it's quantized. So if we have two degrees of freedom, this is what we call also a qubit, 
we have two degrees of freedom per site, that means that in n sites we have two to the n possible states, possible configurations of this system. So we can have all up or up down, up up up, or down down, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We have two n states. So the the amount of states that means the Hilbert space of the system is exponentially large. With, it grows exponentially with n, with the system size. So we cannot deal with that immediately. After 20 sites, we cannot uh, diagonalize these Hamiltonians exactly um, using our normal computers to date until, until quantum computers come out <laughs> to simulate these systems. But now we have to f uh, think of a way to reduce all the, from two to the n states, we have to reduce them to several uh, hundreds of thousands of states and not more than that to be able to deal with it. Now, why are we talking about these materials? Because, well, this is an, a very simple example of these, of, of these strongly correlated materials. This is a simplified version. Many of these, simp of these strongly correlated materials are, are insulating or they, or they have a, a metal insulated transition with certain parameters. And some of them can be modeled with models like these, like this one here. Then I show you another model we've been dealing with. But this is more or less the basic model behind these interacting systems. You see, you cannot make a one particle uh, model with this. You have to deal with all the states, unless you have an intelligent way of decreasing uh, the, the number of states. So, uh, well, by by dividing the system in, in subgroups, this was, wasn't good, because if we divide the system in groups of three and we diagonalize this very small portion, and we, get, we stay with the lowest line energy states, uh, here we are introducing some uh, fixed nodes between this in, within the system, which is not good and gave uh, a lot of error. So that wasn't the way to reduce the state. Uh, just, just let me be a little bit more technical here to show you the, the basic of the DMRG, which is easy to understand. It's very simple uh, if you have a basic in, in quantum mechanics. So how do we get a more systematic way of reducing the Hilbert space? The Hilbert space, remember, is the, the amount of or the space of all possible configurations of the system. So the, the answer given by Steve White in, in 1992, 93 was using the density matrix. How the, does this work? We have four sites in the system. Let's think about the Heisenberg model. So here we have four sites. And here we can have up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So we have two to the four different configurations in this system. Now let's divide the system in two. We have the left, which we call system, and the right, which we call environment. This, uh, so the whole Hilbert space is an external product or a tensor product between I states and J states. Uh, so I can get any wave function of the whole system, let's call it phi naught, in particular the ground state, can be written in a form that we distinguish left from right, i and j. So this is the psi i j are the projections onto left and right. Uh, now, if we define a, a density matrix on the left of the system, so on, on, on this system, the, the density matrix is a trace on all states on j of uh, of, of this um, product of the projections of the wave function. So let's be clear. I mean, we define a density matrix which only mixes states i and i prime to the left, like I show here, which is a trace over all states j of the right of the system. So the environment is a trace on the states of the environment of psi zero i prime j, psi zero i j. If we do this, then if you read it in the fi finance books of uh, statistical physics, it's very well explained there. Um, this is called the density matrix. So this is a matrix that, that uh, makes the states I and I prime. Um, when we diagonalize the density matrix, uh, it, it has a property that um, the trace, of course, of the, the, the the, the adding up, the summation of all the eigenvalues is one because of the definition of a density matrix. And um, the highest, um, uh, sorry, the, the eigenvalue of the density matrix give you the probability of finding the corresponding eigenvector in the state of the system, in the original state of the system, psi zero. So that means that if we keep 
the eigenvectors that have largest eigenvalue, we, we will be keeping the states uh, of this side, which, has, which have a largest uh, projection onto the state we're looking for. So in that way, we are keeping states with the largest information of the system. How does this work? The, the DMRG then, we start, let's say, with four sites. We divide it in two pieces. We do a bipartite division of the system. We define, this is the whole, the ground state of the whole system. We write it in this way. We define the reduced density matrix like I defined as a trace on the environment of these projections. We diagonalize the density matrix. Of course, the trace of the eigenvalues is one. And then we keep the uh, M, uh, a small number of largest eigenvalue states. So we're not keeping all the states, we're only keeping the states that have a largest eigenvalue. And so that's why we, are, uh, we're, we will be doing a, a truncation error of this value here. Once we keep the states we're interested in, we rotate all the operators and, and all the, um, uh, uh, the states in this block and we rotate them, we go to that new space, which is uh, the space defined by the eigenvalues of rho, and we continue growing the system. We add one site, we, re we reproduce the environment, we, this is go to one, it means we define the Hamiltonian in the whole system that gives us a, an eigenstate. That eigenstate is phi, which let's go here again, that's psi, psi, we write it now, now again, we divide the system in two, we define the density matrix in this part of the system, we choose the highest line eigenvalues, and we rotate now this three dots with a new block that contains the largest information of the system. I don't want to, to dive too much into details, but I mean, that's the main idea, how to extract the main information using the density matrix. So this gives us the, all, uh, all this um, slide is to show that the density matrix also has information on the entanglement between uh, left and right. And um, the, the larger the entanglement, um, the more uniform the eigenvalues of the density matrix are. In particular, now let's go to the other extreme. If we do not have entanglement between left and right, so between the system and the environment, if there's zero entanglement, that means that we have a direct matrix product between left and right. And that means that the density matrix has only one eigenvalue and one eigenvector, and the eigenvalue is one. So that's a, a very particular case of zero entanglement. Now, if we, go, uh, if we do have entanglement between left and right, then the density matrix has more than one uh, non-zero eigenvalue. And um, this has to do with what is called the Schmidt decomposition in quantum information theory. The, the Schmidt decomposition between left and right. And uh, one can define an entropy in the same way we can define the a, 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 a thermodynamic entropy, which depends on temperature, which is produced by temperature. Here at zero temperature, we can define what is called the von Neumann entropy, which uh, which has to do with entanglement. So now, instead of temperature, what is, in, what is given as entropy in this part of the system is the entanglement to the rest of the system. So one can define an entropy in, this, in a similar spirit to the thermodynamic entropy as the minus the trace of the re reduced density matrix times log two of the reduced density matrix. So it's the summation of the eigenvalues of the density matrix times the log of the eigenvalues. So this is uh, a weighted, uh, a weighted uh, average of the log of the eigenvalues, and this is in the same spirit as the thermodynamic uh, entropy. And the DMRG, this density matrix RG, works best for small entanglement. So if I give here some examples of uh, some exactly solvable models that have very small entanglement. Well, so, so far with, I'm sorry, just one more thing. The modern version of the DMRG uh, is called MPS. If you see it in, some, in the literature, it's called matrix product states. And it has to do, look at how, I, look at how I'm writing the, the wave function now. I'm writing it as a product of these matrices, A1, A2, A3. And uh, these matrices, you, each square has two indices. You see to the right and downwards. And when I, 
and when I, uh, I I do the product of the indices, then I get this vector here. You see, this is a vector because, I mean, it has only one index here. It's a very nice uh, and intuitive way of, of uh, writing vectors and matrices. And, and if, you, if you look here, we have, for example, if, you, if we want to get the minimum of the Hamiltonian, the mean value of the Hamiltonian in that, uh, in that wave function normalized, this uh, 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 quotient is the ratio is this one re written here. So we have the Hamiltonian is the red the, uh, is the product of the red matrices. So this is uh, this is the Hamiltonian the, the radius of Hamiltonian. This is the wave function to the right. This is the wave function to the left. All this is the numerator of the top form, and this is divided by the um, by the um, uh, product of the wave function. You see here we have the top wave function and the, I mean the right and the left wave function. This is a funny way of, of showing this. Well, the DRMG has been applied to many uh, different, uh, a, a, really a lot of applications since it was discovered uh, nearly um, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, it has been applied to one and two D ladder systems to um, electronic systems, Condon Anderson model, impurity models, quant even quantum hole systems, and it has been extended to to nuclei, small particles, classical systems, also non Hermitian Hamiltonians. It has been extended to finite temperature, uh, to the calculation of Fomalin's bosons disorder, also to molecules and quantum chemistry. Steve White and other people they did a lot of, of work here, which works very well. Momentum representation, uh, time-dependent problems, also dynamical properties. Uh, this is uh, dynamical properties. I had a collaboration with Professor Ramasesha at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and that's why I visited Bangalore several times, and um, and we collaborated uh, very strongly on dynamical properties using DMRG. And then, um, well, so we are now using it as an application to what is called the DMST. The DMST is a very used method called dynamical mean field theory. It's a mean field theory developed by Kotler and, and uh, uh, co uh, collaborators and both and Metzner and Folhat and Antoine Georges, uh, which has become a very, very widely used method to calculate electronic structure of materials. So just uh, to show you, I mean, not to go into details, but we have to deal with very complicated models to study the materials. Here, for example, this uh, material, that have interaction. It's, this is a two orbital Hubbard model. And the Hamiltonian has, uh, for example, uh, hopping between um, different uh, orbitals. We have a chemical potential. We have the hopping within each orbital, within each band. And we also have a term that has interaction. The interactions are complicated because they have on site Coulomb interactions like this. They also have. Uh, inter-orbital interactions, because they are, they are, the electrons on different orbitals, they also uh, interact with, with a Coulomb interaction, and they also have a Hund's uh, magnetic interaction, J, super exchange interaction, uh, an exchange interaction, J, and uh, so it's complicated. Now, here you have some references. I can leave a talk to you if you want to look at uh, the, what we have done with these with these models. So how do you study these models? We cannot do a one electron uh, approximation. We really have to study this numerically to, to see. And, this, and these models are really the basic models, paradigmatic models, the key models to study these correlated materials. And this is what we have to solve. So we're using the dynamical mean field theory, very short. I won't go into the method in depth, but it, it is a mean theory mean field theory, so we have to spot a particular site of the system. Um, and uh, so, well, let, let me start again. I mean, this is the crystalline model we want to we, we want to study. In each site, we have a local interaction. We have all these interactions I showed you, for example, in that Hamiltonian. We pinpoint one particular site, which has all the interactions. But now, this site, um, we we extract it and we call it the effective impurity. It's not an impurity, but it's it's the mean field approximation. This is what we call the. This site has the full interactions of the Hamiltonian, and then we embed this single interacting site into a non-interacting effective medium or effective uh, uh, effective uh, environment. So. 
by doing a, a couple iteratively a couple of interactions uh, a couple of iterations uh, here we can converge to an approximate solution for the interacting model so of course being a mean field theory it's um, exact in infinite dimensions like every mean field theory but it's also very good in lower dimensions the main approximation is uh, this there is a magnitude in correlated systems called the, the local self energy the, the self energy the self energy has to do with interaction of the particles with the rest of the particles and the main approximation within dmft is that the self energy is treated locally like here it does not depend on the site because it's a very local theory one can also instead of looking at one particular site one can get a cluster and replace this cluster for example as a as the effective impurity in the system so now we will have a much richer uh, and more precise representation and so now the uh, uh, this is called the cluster dmft or other versions and then the local self energy won't be so local because it, it will also have a uh, a, uh, a finite size behavior. So, well, this is how the DMFT iterations work, but I, I won't go into that. Uh, one has to one has to do this iteratively. We set the the self energy to zero, then we calculate a Green's function like this with this self energy. Uh, then once we get the Green's function, we have to de de define a hybridization, so define an effective Hamiltonian with this impurity coupled to the bath. But then at some point, at one point, we have to calculate the dynamical response of that impurity with a, with a self-consistent bath. To calculate this Green's function, we use uh, the DMRG. This is called the impurity solver. And it's very important because it's the bottleneck of this, um, of this method. Well, we, we developed the DMRG as impurity solver for this, and it turns out to be very good, much better than the other impurity solvers uh, people have been using. Other impurity solvers are, are all these, so uh, iterative preservation theory, exact diagonalization, uh, Hirsch file quantum Monte Carlo, non crossing approximation, or even numerical romanization group. But um, but the DMRG uh, shows show to work much better because by using quantum information to reduce the Hilbert space, it, it is a much more efficient method to calculate dynamics of strongly correlated systems. The advantages of using DMRG is that one can calculate the dynamics in the real axis directly, the real energy axis, because quantum Monte Carlo gives you results only on imaginary Matsubara frequency. And uh, this is a technical issue, but it's not very good because if you calculate the, uh, uh, I mean, Green's functions are, are complex functions and, uh, and they depend on, uh, on, on complex variables, uh, the complex uh, energy and I energy. Uh, so if you, if you converge on the imaginary axis, and it's very difficult to get results on the real axis. This method has advantage of conversion on the real axis, which is a completely different solution. We can include arbitrary interactions. We don't have any sign problem like the quantum Monte Carlo. We can get large bars, several orbitals, and even finite temperature, but this we still have to explore. Well, let's go now. Let's stop being so technical and we go to some, uh, some results. This is in a collaboration with Gabi Kotliar and Marcelo uh, Rosenberg and Masai Mara in Tokyo and my students. So this is what we have. We, in, in the, a particular iteration of the DMFT, we have the square, which is the effective impurity, that, as I say, can have many different sites. And these circles are the non-interacting bars. We have to solve the dynamics of this. Then to use the DMRG, we, we put it in a one-dimensional form. So we, uh, we crunch this into uh, the impurity again. But you see, this is, this is a one-dimensional form, but it's only topological. It doesn't have any uh, influence on the result. We write the Hamiltonian here, and then we calculate with the DMRG the dynamics of this system, with, an, with this effective Hamiltonian, which represents this system. If we have many sites, we can get as complicated as this. Sorry. Uh, so we can have complex impurities with two sites, with four sites. Each site has its own bar. So it gets complicated very, very quickly. Uh, but this is the only one, the, the most efficient way of dealing with these many body systems. Let, let me go to the results, and now I'm about to finish. So 
let's go, for example, let's look at the two orbital Hubbard model I showed you before. Here we have one orbital at the top, we have the other orbital at the bottom, and we have interactions. So for example, in this site, we, when we have two electrons, we pay energy U, uh, this is a hole. If we have one, in, one electron at the first orbital one and one electron at the orbital two, we pay energy U, uh, U prime, because uh, we also include this term, or we also pay J. What we found in this model by, by using the, DMR, the DMFT with the DMRG as impurity solver, sorry for all the acronyms, <laughs> is that we find new emerging physics and this new emerging quasi-particles in the system and the quasi-particles look like this. So uh, we have uh, the quasi-particles are a doubly occupied site and a hole. And this entity moves independently of all the other excitations and they have a and they're long lived so that's why we call them quasi particles and this is very uh, we were very surprised to find this because we were not looking for for these quasi particles so you have to imagine now this complex systems with two orbitals um this is done in a, a in a two dimensional system so we have a, a whole sheet of uh, orbital 1 and a whole sheet of orbital 2 with all these interactions and then at certain energies, we have these quasi-particles quasi that, are, that are moving uh, as independent new quasi-particles, independent entities. How do we see that? So let me look at this. For example, this is, the, um, uh, this is the density of states. This is the energy again. Zero is a Fermi energy. Uh, this is the density of states of, in black is orbital one, and the density of states of orbital two is red. If U is very large, so the local Coulomb interaction is very large, we have a metal. If, sorry, we have an insulator. So we do not have density of states at a Fermi energy. This is called the lower Hubble bands, and these are called the upper Hubble bands. And you see we have a gap at the Fermi energy. So this is, at, this is all zero temperature. This is a clear insulator for large U. When U is very small, for example, here 2.3, it's, it's more of a mess. We have a metal. So here we have a metal insulated transition dependent on, on the local U. Uh, why do we have a metal? Because this is a Fermi energy, and, and you see in band one and in band two, uh, both of them have a finite density of state of the Fermi energy. That means that we have a metal. We have this, this, these two peaks, the black and the red peaks here. This is a finite size effect, this dip. But here we also have some finite, some finite uh, uh, structure here. We didn't know what it was about. And look at this interesting regime. This is, this is called the orbital selective mode transition. So in this regime, for an intermediate value of U, one of the bands, so the, um, the black, the uh, orbital, orbital one, the black one, uh, has no density of state at the zero. So one of the orbitals is a mod insulator, and the other orbital is a, uh, a metal. So, so you see, uh, here, one of the orbit this is an orbital selective mod case. So one of the orbitals is metallic and the other orbital is insulator. And the orbital that is insulator had develops two peaks here, and these peaks are the peaks that we uh, could relate to the quasi particles. And you see they're very narrow, and uh, this shows you the existence of these special long lived quasi particles in the system. And we were able to see this only because we have a very precise way of calculating spectral densities. Previous studies on this same model using quantum Monte Carlo, using um, NRG, numerical organization group, were not able to see the detail enough, were not detailed enough to be able to uh, extract these quasi particles in this model. Uh, so the way we, we uh, found these quasi particles, you see, is this is a quasi particle here, and the blue, the blue uh, curve is a response function by creating this quasi particle in, in the system with this operator here, I don't, I don't go into the details, but we, we create a quasi particle and we see it has exact overlap with the quasi particle uh, we mentioned. So just to finish, this is my, la my last uh, result. Uh, we now very recently, we sent to the archive our results on the same model, but for the whole doped case. I mean, I was showing you the half field case and now we're looking at, at the whole doped case. That means that we are not, um, we're putting more holes into the system by changing the chemical potential. And here we see, uh, if you look at this figure to the left, again, we have the energy, we have the Fermi energy at zero. And these are identity of states for different values of U. 
when um, uh, uh, sorry, remember we had the local U and we had the interorbital, uh, what is called U2. When the interorbital uh, is zero, uh, we have, this is a doped band. Look, we have a finite density of states uh, at the Fermi energy. And so it is a metal because it's doped. And then the upper Hubbard band, which is near uh, energy four, um, it, here, this is the upper Hubbard band, okay? And, and so then when we start cranking up the interorbital interaction, U, what we find is that if you look, if you look at the upper Hubbard band, there is a whole new structure which is emerging. It's pulled up, pulled down from the upper Hubbard band, which is this structure here, and which we call the, the Holland Dublin band. So it's a band formed by these quasi particles that is extracted from the upper Hubbard band. So uh, without going much into here, you see it much more. It's in, into the right, we see again the lower Hubbard band and all these other sub bands are bands that are formed by these special uh, quasi-particles like the whole on Dublin and et cetera. All this substructure has not been seen with other methods as I said before. So now we hope that by having found, um, having uh, uh, found with high precision the density of states in these systems, then we can have a better method to try to see what the microscopic behavior in these many body highly interacting systems is. So well, just to conclude, um, these uh, final thoughts are, uh, it's important to unveil the details in the spectral densities of correlated quantum materials. And this will help us understand the microscopic mechanisms that lead to the, this emergent or interesting physical properties. To do that, we have to develop uh, sophisticated numerical tools. One uh, based on, we have based our numerical tool on the DMFT. And this relies on the calculation of the quantum, effective quantum impurity. Now we solve the quantum impurity using the, the DMRG, which resorts to quantum information to extract the most important information. And this, this shows to be very efficient in extracting the relevant uh, physics of the system. And uh, this method allows uh, to resolve with unprecedented detail the local density of states of some of these materials. So we're working on that. So then, well, uh, just to finish, I want to show you another picture of Patagonia. This is a Fitzroy. And just to tell you that we are just beginning to unveil the mysteries of strongly correlated quantum matter, but there's still a long and fascinating way ahead. So muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pretam. I thank you at the university for, for your kind invitation. It's, it's been a pleasure to, to collaborate and con contribute to these exciting seminars. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for your wonderful session, madam. So we have got a few questions in inbox. So if we allow, we can start. So yes, of course. Maybe a first question is Heisenberg model. What is the as you have already explained about the Heisenberg model? Could you uh, uh, so uh, he asks that what is Heisenberg model? Maybe yeah. We have the, 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 the question is, what is the Heisenberg model? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the Heisenberg model is, uh, well, I'm still sharing the screen, so let me show it to you again. Uh, the Heisenberg model is a very basic model for many, many systems, uh, for many theories, and even for neural networks, for example, because the Heisenberg model is a, is a, can be in many, defined in many dimensions. In one dimension, I show, I'm showing here, in two or three dimensions or n dimensions. The model itself is written here. Here you see the Hamiltonian. Uh, and it, uh, it's a model where you put one spin one half in each side of the system. You must, you must have studied the Ising model or Ising model. The Ising model is a classical version of the Heisenberg model. In the Ising model, we only have a, a, a one or a zero or, or, a, or one half minus one half in each side, but there is only uh, a diagonal interaction between this system. So, so it has one energy when they are parallel and another energy when, when they are anti-parallel, and then one can calculate the ground state of that system, but that is classical. When we're looking at the quantum version, we not only have the SZ SZ interaction, but we also have the SX SX and SY SY that comes from here. 
That means that we have a, a spin flip term, and this is a quantum term in this. So, so just to answer very quickly, the Heisenberg model is a quantum model in a system, in an array of sites where in each site we have a sp quantum spin one half that interacts with its nearest neighbor uh, in a in a um, S dot S way because the spin this spin is S X S Y S Z is a vector and this is S dot S so you have the three terms and the and the, um, uh, one can write it in a with a spin flip term. So this is a very simple model, but it really captures the basic information of many magnetic systems. Thank you, madam. There is another question. So thank you, madam, for your presentation. Uh, could I ask one question? So what is or how, what, what, what is the electro electronic spectral density, and how can we measure this? Exactly. So, the, the spectral density, let me go and show you again. Uh, let's see what we can see here, for example, because here we have experiments. Let me, let me go again to, um, um, let me go again to this. Uh, here we have, um, for example, the, spe the spectral density, electronic spectral density tells you for each uh, energy of this, uh, for each energy, how many electronic states you have. So that is a spectral, the, the spectral density or, or, or the density it's or the density of states. Usually they use the word spectral density uh, when for this same concept, but when you discriminate it in momentum. Uh, so, so you see for a certain energy and a certain momentum, how many electronic states are having the system. And this you do for every energy and for every momentum in the system. Uh, let's forget about momentum. We add up all the momentum. So we're looking at the, what is called the local density of states. And this is, you have the, the energy of the system. Of, for each energy, you see here zero, et cetera. Let's look at this curve. Uh, the largest amount of states, we have it for energy 1.4 here, where you see this hump, okay? So this is how the, the uh, the electronic uh, states are distributed in energy in this material, and this is characteristic for each material. This is the, the definition of the of the local density of state. And you can imagine then, as I said, in the Fermi energy, so here in zero, if you do not have electronic states, if you do not have, the, the electrons cannot have that, that zero energy, that's Fermi energy. So that means that we, we, for very low temperature, we do not have uh, electronic states to move in the system. There is a, what is called the energy gap, okay? And how can you measure it? You can measure it, as I said, with photo emission. So I, I, I throw photons to the system and, uh, and I emit electrons. So I, I, I kick out electrons from the system by throwing photons, by throwing uh, electro, electromagnetic radiation that can be uh, X-rays or, or other, with other energy. Thank you, madam, uh, for your nice presentation and discussion session. So uh, I think students have learned a lot of things about uh, your research and uh, the position of electronic uh, spectral densities. So uh, I'd like to say thanks again on the behalf of the Department of Physics from the University of Science and Technology for accepting our invitation. Uh, it, it was a very great webinar with you, and uh, I have uh, uh, done a great thing uh, that I have uh, dedicated this uh, this webinar to two legends. Uh, one is uh, Douglas Chandra Bosu, uh, famous physicist of uh, this part and uh, uh, legend player Diego Maradona. So thanks again for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, I, I want to uh, say thanks again. And uh, in near future, I will arrange another web webinar with you. And after the COVID, we will definitely invite you to visit our country. It's a very beautiful country, and you should visit. And you will get a lot of Maradona lover and Argentina lover. So thanks again. <laughs> OK, I, I, hope, uh, I hope I wasn't too complicated at some point. And, but please, uh, Pratham, if, if uh, some of the students or some of the researchers want my email to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll, or, I'll, or send, to send, them. I'll, I'll send them. Because and, maybe many, many things are, are, have not been very clearly. I wanted to just have a, give you an impression of what we're working on. Many things may, be, may have not been well understood. But with a lot of with pleasure, I would discuss with other people and also with you. So it has been a, a real yeah. pleasure to meet you. Thank you.
and the video will uh, will it will still remain in the youtube and the facebook so anybody can ask questions so i think you will uh, respond them uh, in later so by seeing the question so thanks again okay uh, uh, so uh, uh, see you very soon and bye for today good night okay good night to good all night. of you thank you very much again